Hey guys, welcome to my shed. I am Ken with Palmiro Junk Pile Guitars. If you're one of my regular subscribers, welcome back. Appreciate your support. If you are new and you're coming in from another source like Guitar Kit World, a link from there. Hey, glad to meet you, partner. Oh, meet Chick Flick Teal Pointer, integral part of the show. Wouldn't be the show without Chick Flick Teal Pointer. Anyway, if you're new here, you're going to see some things that you've never seen before, I guarantee you. And if you're not wanting to do that, if you're not the adventurous type, it's time for you to leave. Go, go, go. You're still here? That's on you. Okay, still here? All right, let's put some light on some things. Let's get that ring light out of the way there. There we go. Perfect. Listen, I am known to build guitars out of just about anything. License plates, coffee cans. What do you got? If I can put a neck on it, I'm going to build it. So after I build a ton of cigar box guitars, who is not building cigar box guitars right now? Exactly. So, sooner or later, you're going to get into other stuff. And I started getting into arch tops. Take these old, like this 40 model silver tone, and uh, bust it up, cracked, V-neck. And I take these things which were fairly undependable when they came out for Christmas in the 1940s. This is something you would give to your nephew to bother your brother or sister, and they would play it for a while, give it up, put it in the attic, and then i come along 60-some years later and buy it up, and it's all beat up and cracked up. So what I do is I take and turn it into something like this, which is basically a dive bar hot rod. We're going to call this one the California Junk Pile, and there's an episode linked to how this guitar was built right up there, right about now. If you float your mouse around up there till an eye pops up, you're going to see links about the episodes I speak of, including one where we talk about these guitars and how to tell what they're worth and what will cost to fix them before you put out your hard-earned money. But this guitar had a lot of structural work on the inside. Um, has a lot of stuff put on it, has good good equipment on it and stuff. And this is a great guitar if you're going to sit around the house or play some garage band. But here's been my problem. My early instruments, uh, the cigar box guitars, that kind of stuff, they were known to be durable. I build my stuff durable so that you can go out on, on the road with people and they pull them out as a novelty instrument and people like that. And all that. But when it gets into these things, even when I bolt the neck on, do structural stuff inside, put good pickups, if you are going to be on the road do, doing 300 shows a year, these things don't stand up to that. So a wise old luthier named Fred Wilecki told me, you are constantly worried about the structural integrity of your stuff after it goes on the road. Hey, start with something good that you don't have to worry about. Do your junk piling up, make something unique, and giving our artists something that's unique that the, the, the audience will love while they're playing, but that's dependable and can do the kind of work you needed to do with a touring artist. So, I did a kit guitar, an ES-175 style, that I called the Mississippi Mudslide. It was actually stained with Mississippi dirt and Mississippi river water, and the whole build for that kit is right up there. And I got it from Guitar Kit World. Now, I just recently got another Guitar Kit World kit in, and we are going to build a guitar, and we're going to call it Bob. Bob the Guitar. Bob is headed for a crazy, crazy life. That's all I'm going to tell you right now. So what we're going to do is we're going to open up the box, we're going to look at Bob, and then I'm going to give you a little quick, short pieces of how I build this kit out, and we'll have a look at it at the end. So... Let's do what we need to do and hit the bench. All right, let's start with this Guitar Kit World. Yeah, thank you too, Guitar Kit World. You know what? Um, one more time, hover your mouse right up there. See the build out of the Mississippi Mudslide kit I did. 
And it's going to go into deep, deep detail, the kind of detail we're not going to do here. But what I'm looking for in a kit is I am going to stain this body in a way that's going to freak you guys out. And it's going to go with the theme with the artist that, that those of you that know them, him, uh, will, will recognize right away. But the first thing I'm looking at is how is the body... How much sanding is there to do? Is there a bleed through of glue over on the binding? Yeah, it's got binding. It's got good binding, good wood. Are there any cracks? Are there any patches? How's the binding up here on this neck pocket? I prefer these neck pockets because those old K's and silver tones, the necks are always popping off of them and stuff. And I need something that that is beefy, that's going to fit in and not cut loose. I, I literally have said I could rake a flower bed or dig a hole with these guitars. They're, they're that tough. But I'm looking at everything. Sometimes you want to make sure this stuff isn't cracked, this kind of stuff. But here's what's really important to me. Besides all these parts, and we'll go through those in a minute, if for the price I paid for this kit, all I got was this body and this neck fit the way it does, I would be happy because then I can go through and do uh, whatever I want with it and, and buy stuff. Now, Guitar Kit World offers you options on what kind of tuners or whatever you want to put on. But this is the part right here that I'm most concerned with. You'll see that this is tapered. You'll see that this is solid. Oh, by the way, check out. Uh, it's got fret markers. Um, uh, there's nothing, nothing sticking out. We'll we'll fine tune the frets at the end. But the big thing here is this is slotted. If I try to put it in here, it won't go in. I have to go right over everything and slip it down, and it fits like a glove. Look, there's no slop in there, and that angle is about what I need. The nut looks good. The frets look good. So, first thing I'm going to do with this part is I'm going to sand down the body. And I don't really want to spend a lot of time doing that. It doesn't appear like I'll have to. I'm going to look around the edges. Is there any bleed off from the glue from the binding? No. Does the binding need to be worked? Is it smooth? Do you have any big, big sanding parts to do, especially where this recurve is, where this drops down. This is an actual arch top. See that? Where it drops down here. You want to make sure nothing's collecting in there because when we go to stain this thing, this stuff will show up there. So, I'm going to want to hit this with 400 grit right away. I don't want to start with uh, all kinds of coarser grits and do a lot of sanding. I just want to basically get to work here prep it, get the fingerprints, glue, anything that's going to show up and ready for the stain. Okay, let's take a look at what comes with the kit. We've got a pit guard. Good. It's got purfling on it. A couple different layers. Looks good. Solid. It all comes with the kit. There's our wiring harness. Already wired up. Um, you got to put a jack on it. Other than that, it's ready to go. You got the knobs. Those might work with what I want to do. You got good tuners. They're good, heavy, solid tuners. I'm getting to like these tuners a lot more than those ones with the tulip style knob on them. These are good, solid tuners. Everything's chrome, got nuts. Strap buttons. Ooh, look at this. Rollomatic floating bridge. Now, what I'm going to tell you is there's some stuff on here I'm going to change right away. Um, just because of the artist's preference. But look at that. That's ready to go. Is it sanded to the top? Oh, pretty close. Look at that. I've done a lot of videos on my channel about how to fit. Uh, floating bridges to a top. Um, got a good beefy tailpiece with a nice design. Um, all this comes with it. There's a set of strings with it and um, there's even a cord, believe it or not, a guitar cord. So, 
all this comes with it, all the hardware, everything you need to do. Now, of course, I can't do that. I got to do some other stuff. So let me show you what a little bit of that stuff looks like so I can intrigue you before we get on the board. Okay, we're going to try to keep this as short as possible, but I am going to put a crazy finish on this. It's going to be a natural finish. And um, it'll surprise you what it's made out of. But the first thing we need to do is take a look at how this came out of the factory. I don't want to be spending a lot of time sanding. I don't want a lot of glue. I don't want a lot of spots. I don't want a lot of something on here that's going to not take the stain evenly. Because this wood on this guitar is really nice. Got a nice pattern and everything. Um, the parting lines where everything comes together matches up. It's... It's a great looking piece of wood. So when I start looking at these kits, and let me prop this up a little bit if I can do that. Yeah, we'll just do that. Um, I start looking at where the holes are drilled. Remember, um, this came to me as a deal because the holes aren't exactly in the right place. So I want to look, is there anything there that um, is rough, broken out. Um, I can take my reamer here and go down into these holes like this and get rid of any of the burrs that are there. Uh, but no cracks, no anything. So the first thing I do is I take a piece of wipe all. This is paper. It's a rag, but it's dustless, uh, lintless, but it does pick up if there are spots on the guitar coming out of the factory that are rough especially down in here with this radius where it comes off the arch and comes back down. If you have stuff collecting in here, it's going to show up on the finish, and I don't want that. So I take a piece of wipe all rag, W-Y-P-A-L-L -L, number 80, and I'm going over this. I don't really feel anything. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the 400 grit sandpaper. That's pretty fine already. Uh, and then we're going to follow that up with 1,200 Okay, and we're going to go over the whole thing. We're going to work the top first, and we'll do the sides and the bottom separately. Now, what I want to look for is where this binding is. If there's glue or anything like that or little spots, it looks to be something right there. I can take a scraper. Got to have a good selection of scrapers. Some more flexible than others. See this one? Um, but you can go along the edges now. You don't want to scrape too much of the binding because when I stain this, I may want to come back and reveal the binding. You're going to find that the arch top makers would put their finish on and then come back and finish with a scraper. But I've got a little spot of glue right here. I can come in and do this and get rid of that. Of course, anything you do after you sand it, you want to come back. You want to hit it with the 400 grit like that. You don't want to have a bunch of fingerprints and solvents and things like that. But you go along, and wherever there's a spot, good. Now, you also want to check where the F holes are and make sure everything is clean there. And that's where this violin maker's knife comes in. Let me see if I can get this up here where you can see it without making everything crash. There's a little bit of a tailing of a binding right there on the end that f hole so these are sharp work away from you you can just come in like so and touch that up go around to everywhere where there's a potential issue like that and scrape everything off and again run over with the sandpaper and this thing is good to go i will tell you um short of going along uh somewhere where the the pickup pocket is in the neck pocket you can go along and get rid of some of the edges and the rough parts, but there's nothing broken on here. And short of running the reamers down the holes a little bit, this thing's ready to go. I'm happy with it. So you can see me do a little sanding here on top before we move on to the next part.
Now we are going to seal the body with some potassium silicate. And I did an episode about sealing a guitar with Mississippi River mud and using an ancient violin technique. I'm going to give you a link to it right up there right about now. But it's the same thing. We are going to seal this so it protects the integrity of the surface. It's not going to allow the guitar to dry out and crack and all those kinds of things. And it's going to give us a transitional layer to put whatever we're going to stain this with, with which you're not going to believe. But we're going to make sure that we use these bean bags. They're literally velvet bags with beans in them to make sure that the guitar is level because we don't want the product that we're using to be running down the side. So we're going to pad this up and we're going to get it nice and level and give ourselves a good, even, controllable workspace. Again, anytime we touch the guitar, we want to wipe it down and make sure that there's no fingerprints or oils or solvents on it. There we go. All right, guys, we're going to pay close attention now because we are going to use wipe all rags. We're going to rag on what we're going to do here rather than brush it. We're going to start with potassium silicate. Potassium silicate will act as a sealer. While it is still wet, it'll start to become tacky. It'll sink down in the wood and it will give us a base coat and a transition layer to introduce our seal, which is going to be oak gall ink. Now I gave you an episode about this and the link to it is right up there right about now. There are wasps that lay eggs in the axles of oak tree leaves and create these big growths and for centuries they have made ink out of oak galls. The Constitution of the United States was signed in oak gall ink. Anyway, episode right up there right about now. But what we're going to do is we're going to move very quickly. We're going to rag this on. Get it on the top. We're only going to work the top. We're going to make sure it doesn't run down the sides and everything. We're going to be very careful with wipe all rag. Come along and do this. Get it wet. And then we'll immediately, while this is still tacky with the potassium silicate, we will do the first coat of oak gall ink. Like, dude, you just ruined this guitar. Yeah, I thought so too, but wait a little bit. You'll see. You have little faith in my ability to junk pile out a perfectly good guitar. All right, guys, look at that. What a mess, huh? What a beautiful mess. Now, tricky part of this is... I can take my scraper that I made out of a band from a 48 inch tree box and I can walk around like this to this binding and that white binding, I'll bring it down to level and it will pop against this dark black oak gall ink. There we go. I do the bottom and the sides, and I'll catch up with you then. All right, guys, we got the sides, the back, and the top of Bob, the junk pile archtop guitar, stained with oak gall ink that we made ourselves. Now, put several coats on, and while I was waiting for this to dry last night, I went and saw. That's right, Reverend Peyton, Big Damn Band in Los Angeles. Now, that this is dry, I am going to work to get the binding. You see that binding right there? How I'm just scraping along here. We're going to work to expose this binding, and it will stand out like a sore thumb against this oat gall ink. Now while I'm doing that I'm going to multitask and I am going to do the same thing with this neck. We are going to stain the neck, the areas that won't have a glue matching surface. 
um, with said oat gall ink. Now you'll notice that I have taped off the fingerboard, the binding that goes alongside of it and everything, because I don't want to get this all over that. So once I get the oat gall ink on this neck, it's going to need to soak in. It's going to take a couple of coats. That's going to take some time. And in that time, I'm going to be listening to my new vinyl Reverend Peyton Big Damn Band dance songs for hard times. There's a great song on here if you like laundromats because Reverend is the king of the laundromat. Okay, let's catch up. I have the neck stained, and um, it turned out super dark. The oat gall ink does that to things. I think a tie-dye shirt would be cool with this stuff, but where we're at right now, I wanted you to see, look at the contrast. This is how the wood started, and that's how it looks now. What we're going to do now is we're going to make sure where this part fits into the neck and glues into the neck. Can you see where I'm talking about? Right there. Thank you, Chick Flick Teal Pointer. Um, we're going to take some sandpaper and even this violin maker's knife and make sure that this is square because if there's any bumps or things aren't even here or here, here, your neck will pitch one way or the other, then your frets won't be right. So we're going to pay attention to that. Next... We have taped off or masked off the body because this all got covered up. The binding got all covered up with oat gall ink. So now what we're going to do, we get things arranged here, is we're going to stand this up and we're going to go through the tedious process of taking the violin maker's knife and scraping the binding like so this is tedious like I said we're going to scrape the binding like so and expose all of that can you see that and now we're going to take the sanding block and do this this is going to provide a nice contrast it's not going to get every bit of it off uh, but look at this guitar it's not meant to look brand new so All right, guys, it's fixing to get exciting now. This guitar came with some extra holes in the body. People be like, well, why would you want that? Well, believe me, I want it. You see it? Wherever the red orange tape is. I want to tell you, if you haven't seen this before, this tape dispenser is the handiest thing in the world. It's just glamorous, and it makes things pop right into play. There we go. So, there's the holes. Now... Believe this or not, I just happen to have some wood that is from a place where Mississippi Fred McDowell and George Mitchell met in 1967. They subsequently recorded a record, and on that record is one Eli Green singing a song called Bulldog Blues. You will notice that in my guitars there is on the fifth string... The second lightest string, oh, is a bead. That's called the Eli Green Hoodoo Voodoo bead. Anyway, now that this top is finished, we got the binding done, we still have to spray it. I am going to take some of this Fred McDowell relic wood and embed it in this guitar. Why? Because the person that's getting the guitar was influenced at a very young age by that same song, 
Bulldog Blues, and they figured out if I run a slide up and down the neck, it sounds like a horse galloping or something when the slide hits the fret. So, how do we do this? Well, we take a piece of wood like this, we put it in a vise like this, we figure out what the hole is, we take a plug cutter, we run the plug cutter backwards on the wood in the vise so it doesn't slip off. You see that? And we end up with this. That goes right down in the hole. We have the tape here. So once everything is in, we can take a razor saw and cut very close after we glue everything and then tap it the rest of the way in. So I am going to put Fred McDowell relic wood in these holes. We'll stain that just a slightly different color. When someone sees this guitar, they'll say, what is that? And we can call it branch whorls or some other arborist term that I made up, but y'all know what's going on. All right, we've got our Mississippi Fred McDowell relic wood here, there, and everywhere. Now it's time for the next part of the big adventure. I have an oil pressure gauge from a T-model Ford. The artist that this guitar is going to used to tour around with somebody who called himself T-model Ford in the 90s. This was an old man, picked up the guitar at 57 years old, when his wife left him and decided he was going to pick up about six, seven chords and call himself a blues phenom, which he kind of was. So we're going to put this in there so our artist can remember his good times with T model Ford. Anyway, I have a little problem. There was a three-way switch here. If I take this Forstner bit that's necessary, it's smaller than the bezel, but big enough to fit this body so this thing will ride on the bezel right here if i put this in here that point is going to hit, isn't going to hit wood and it's going to wander all over the place so what we're going to do is i made this template by drilling through here like so okay now if i clamp this on here like so I can center this up wherever I want it and because I drop this into what's already drilled it's going to work out just fine yeah you don't want to mess this part up that's for sure there's no way to take care of a big hole this big in a fine guitar like this one Right, guys, get ready to see the surgical neck procedure on Bob the Junk Pile guitar. So, what's going to happen here, what's already happened, is we've taken this block of wood that's a cigar box neck, cut off, put a piece of 400 grit sandpaper, sanded all this and that down like so, taking our violin maker's knife, got all the edges and the binding just right where this is going to sit this neck is going to sit right down in this pocket no problem now what you see here is part of a neck removal jig which is going to allow us to put clamps onto something that we don't have to worry about tearing up this part is cushioned with cork paper we have more cork paper here because the neck is radiused, meaning it curves like this. If we press straight down and clamp straight down, something's going to twist this way or this way or this way. If we put this here, the cork paper 
will form to the radius. We put two clamps on, everything's okay. So we've got this special rag here bracing everything off. And I know you want to see it. This is the other half of the neck removal jig. Torturous device. If I have an info card, I will give you a link to that episode right up there, right about now, how to build it. So, one more thing I want to point out to you is I have this warmer for the hide glue. We want the hide glue to be hot. So we take this flux brush, which is not a flux capacitor brush, but a flux brush, and we are going to spread the glue on the neck like so. Everywhere where there's a glue surface, we want to make sure that it flows on there pretty good. Again, wherever there's going to be contact, we want there to be glue. There's plenty of surface on the bottom here. There's even some on the front there and the side there. These brushes are awesome. I've got a little bit of water down in this heater because once I'm done, I can just use that hot water to wash this brush out like so. All right, here we go. It is the moment of truth in which we are going to push this neck down into this joint with plenty of hide glue and every surface that's going to made up. Here we go. We've got a rag right away to get to this stuff that's squeezing out like so. Now we're going to put the cork paper over it and put these clamps, one here on this side and one on the other side. And we'll wait for glue to dry. There we go. Okay, I've got the neck glued on and clamped up. And I want to show you a little trick here. Well, I've got this water. See, there's water in here. It's hot water. I put my, let me show you here. I put my hide glue in here to heat it up. And while it's heating up, that water helps it heat up. But once I'm done, I've got hide glue drying out and I want to reuse these brushes. So I've got hot water in here. I can also take this piece of wipe all rag and you can see that in these tight spaces where the neck glues up right here, there's bound to be some bleed off. So I put this rag here like so, and I take my wipe all, put some of that hot water in here, put it on a chisel, and then I can run it along the edge there and get any bleed off that's happening on the neck right here out of the way, and then also right here. Got to get that while it's hot. Handy little trick. Hey guys, guess what? Bob, the junk pile arch top is going to disappear for a while, but don't worry, Bob is going to be okay. What we're going to do is we're going to dress Bob up and we're going to theme Bob to some different things that's going to fit the artist. So let's start off. we got a couple of Arizona license plates we're going to use. They're a little bit different ones. Cactus on it. You know what I'm talking about, S.A.? What's happening, Holmes? Then we're going to have um, some matchbooks, time market, cool motor, not cold motor. Hey, you guys, how far is the old log in? Got uh, Ron Tell uh, Airport. Bud Isaacs, cowboy, and you know who Bud Isaacs was, steel guitar player, and then Spaceland, Los Angeles, there ain't no dive bar like Spaceland, I think it's called the Satellite now, anyway, we're going to dress this thing up, and I don't want to ruin it, you'll see it all at the, what do they call that, the reveal, I'm not sure that's appropriate, but anyway, don't worry about SA, 
We're going to bring it home soon for you. All right, it's been a while since you saw Bob and a lot's happened. Um, first off, we put a piezo underneath here. I did an episode to show you how to do that. And we've got two pickups. Two pickups, yeah, a piezo and a coil, but we have two input jacks. One of them goes to the piezo, which has its own volume control. Now let's turn on the substandard workshop wiring that is the shed and listen to the piezo it's got this thing where you can do some buck of white style slapping and and uh running stuff up and down the fretboard that you can hear you hear that but the bottom line is it magnifies the acoustic level of the guitar does that sound familiar to you? Well, it will. And then the next thing we have is we have the coil, which again is off of a 1965. It's okay. Check the teal pointer. I'm not scabbing your work. A silver tone Kleenex box Hershey bar, uh, whatever you want to call it, pickup from a 1965 silver tone it has its own volume control there is no tone control if you're a guitar player you don't need tone control right watch your tone all right so last couple of things we're going to do here is i've got the intonation um, set up so we're going to measure from the back of the nut to the 12th fret take that same measurement and make sure that bridge is right where it needs to be now i'm going to take this paint pen and mark just in case this guy that's playing this gets really really wild i guarantee you and we're going to take and make marks where that person could line up everything again if they need to then I got a little I'm gonna set the uh, the grooves in the bridge just down just a little bit you wouldn't believe the size of string here this string it's the size of a rig up truck winch line that I used to run in the oil fields got some um, filing to do on the nut but one of the last things I do when you're working on arch tops it's a nightmare but I got to put a Palmiro junk power guitars California down in to there like that and then I just use the adhesive and this election pencil to push everything in there okay let me put this up on the bench so you can see the sheer magnitude that is Bob the junk pile archtop. Good morning, camera person. Wake up, guitar is other zoom out and over here. There we go. All right, isn't that beautiful? There's some you're saying, but but yeah, we're looking at the butt. So the most important thing about this guitar is that sticker right there. Tim Loman did the Palmero Junk Pile Guitar Label, but this is the back. It is stained with oak gall ink. That is beautiful. And then we come up to the top. We've got a pair of odd looking things that are chrome. One of them is strap button. The other one is a grease zerk. I always have grease zerks because that's right if you're playing it gets rusty. And we come up. We have a pair of Grover tuners, a set of Grover tuners, not a pair. Nice pair, but they're a set. And Tammy's signature is there. There is the back. Now, sit down because you're fixing to be completely and utterly disamazed. Okay, before we set it in the rack, I got to make sure I got a close up of two jacks. For the people that can't figure out why I do this, forget your three-way switch. This is how we do it. All right. 
we have a tailpiece that holds some heavy strings. We have a floating bridge. We have volume control and knobs for piezo, which is right under here, under the under the body, not under the bridge, but right here. We have volume control for the 1965 silver tone pickup, Hershey bar, Kleenex box, whatever you want to call it. There's an Arizona, 1954 Arizona Wheaties bicycle license plate serving as surround. We have a 1969 Arizona license plate serving as the pit guard. We have a an English is very important here and how we use it. We have an oil gauge from a T model Ford that plays into this artist's story. We have matchbooks from Spaceland in Los Angeles. The only bit that's played there. It used to be the satellite. Bud Isaacs, Cowboy Inn in Phoenix. Bud Isaacs was a steel guitar player. We have the Rontel Arizona Airport in Tucson. We have the Log Inn. And then we have not cold motor, but cool motor. And then we have the Time Market. I think that's probably a big deal to somebody. Anyway, we have a my hand holding a hand, um, an Arizona license plate with a saguaro cactus up there. Again, Grover tuners and the truss rod cover was salvaged from the same license plate as this. So let's zoom in. Other zoom in camera person. I'm the camera person. Just do what I tell you. Okay. All right, let's pan down. Is it pan if you're going vertical? I don't know. There's a lot of Hollywood types around here. Hey, Santa, how you doing? Yeah, I've been good. Don't count the rest of the year. And there we go. We need to pan out a little bit now. Oh, there we go. Look at that. Do, do, do. All right, there it is. Let's close out this episode. <laughs> buck of white action there maybe not anyway bob the junk pile arch top is done about a week from now i'm going to meet up and do a handoff somebody's going to fly in from some other country and take this thing and go beat it up it's going to be in a boat on a boat in the street people are going to be stomping on it this thing is built tough and it's going to be with this art, artist, a testament to the durability of my guitars and why I got into kit guard guitars and kind of gave up. Oh, I still got a ton of these. Do not covet these. Anyway, hard to believe a couple weeks ago, this was a fresh kit guitar. I'm happy, I'm happy with the way it turned out. Uh, thanks for watching my channel, and I hope that you are getting some inspiration again if you get a guitar and you paint it like Eddie Van Halen's guitar people are not going to believe it's Eddie Van Halen's guitar so do your own thing make stuff pick up what your art is and if you haven't done so already give me a like and give me a subscribe and I can't wait until you see the next madness that I come up with on this channel. I'll see you soon. Oh!